As 5G and the Internet of Things connect the digital and physical worlds, the attack surface expands and the impact of an attack can be more severe, even catastrophic. To stay ahead of the threat, you need cybersecurity experts who understand how attacks happen, why they happen, and how to prevent them. As the nation's largest cybersecurity services provider, we're inventing and integrating what's next so you can defend against the toughest adversaries. We work shoulder to shoulder with federal, defense, and intelligence agencies, and some of the world's top businesses with cutting edge technologies and techniques. We provide a holistic approach to focus and optimize your cyber investments against the highest risks. Design and build secure and resilient systems based on zero trust architecture principles and implement proactive, preventative cyber defense operations. We work across government and industry to innovate in healthcare help people connect securely, and protect our nation from the ground up. We open the aperture on tomorrow's landscape and lead the edge of cyber warfare. For government, for business, for the future, we help you navigate for tomorrow while ensuring your mission is secured today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Tina Jordan, Vice President for Membership, AFSIA International. Hi. So right off the bat, I would like to invite to the stage Lieutenant General Susan Lawrence, United States Army Retired President and CEO of AFSIA International to help me with a special presentation. AFSIA has 138 chapters around the world, and these chapters are run by volunteers, and it's this incredible group of volunteer leaders who help us to achieve AFSIA's mission of bringing together military, government, industry, and academia across the globe. AFSIA's chapters are organized into regions, and each region has a regional vice president, also a volunteer, who helps to bridge the gap between our amazing chapter leaders and the staff at AFSIA headquarters. Most of our regional vice presidents have served in numerous chapter leadership positions during their AFSIA careers, and they provide invaluable guidance and support to their chapters. So today is a bittersweet day as we recognize one of our own regional vice presidents who is stepping down after many years of distinguished service. So now I would like to invite to the stage Carl Bass, CEO of Bass Tech Solutions. Carl has done a phenomenal job as a regional vice president for the Florida region since taking on his position in 2016. Carl's three chapters, the Central Florida chapter, Jacksonville, and the South Florida chapter have greatly benefited from his wisdom and counsel over the past six years. Previous to serving as regional vice president, Carl was extremely active with the Central Florida chapter and served in several officer positions. Carl was also a strong advocate for the old Land Warnet Conference, especially after it moved from Fort Lauderdale to Tampa. While we will miss having Carl as a regional vice president, we thank him for his years of dedication to FCA, and we look forward to his continued contributions to the Central Florida chapter. So Carl, in recognition of your achievements and your dedicated service to FCA, we want to present you with this plaque and this gift from all of FCA. We th give you a warm thanksgiving for all that you've done for us. Please give a big round of applause to Carl Bass. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Colonel Mike Warlick, U.S. Marine Corps retired, Vice President, Defense, FCA International. Good afternoon, everyone. Since this morning, we've had a number of things take place, just to give you a, a reminder of uh, what we have done. We had a, a pop quiz during uh, lunch. It was a CENTCOM presentation on the partner, uh, collaborative member uh, partner environment. Uh, and uh, everybody who attended that will get a free lunch Saturday. Oh, I forgot we're not we're not here Saturday, but but we had a good we had a good crowd show up for that, and it was a it was a request that came in late last week, and to try to offer that we did, and we had a nice joint uh, uh, group that was in there. Uh, we also had a PEOC 3T session that went over to the Cyber Center, 
and, uh, and that was very successful. And we've also had two classified sessions we had, which we had advertised earlier. So we continue this afternoon. It's now uh, uh, my, uh, my, my opportunity to uh, invite Ms. Deb Karagoshin to the stage uh, to, from Booz Allen Hamilton to introduce our afternoon keynote speaker. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Welcome to this afternoon's keynote session titled Distributed C2 at TechNet Augusta. And thank you, FCA International. Um, I'm Deb Karagos, and I lead Booz Allen Hamilton's advanced cyber operations efforts in our national cyber platform. And Booz Allen is a proud sponsor of TechNet Augusta, and I'm honored that my team chose me to be here among you, my Signal and Cyber family, to introduce this afternoon's keynote speaker. Lieutenant General Brunson is the commander of America's First Corps, supporting the Indo-PACOM Theater. He's no stranger to the challenges of leading soldiers in the information age, and he's leading our Army's efforts integrating the cyber warfighting domain to, into multi-domain operations in the Pacific. He served in numerous key leadership positions to include Assistant Commanding General of the 1st Special Forces Command Airborne, Deputy Commanding General for Operations of 10th Mountain Division Light Infantry, Chief of Staff of 18th Airborne Corps and Combined Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve in Iraq, and Deputy Commander of 1st Corps and Commanding General 7th Infantry Division. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of AFSI International, I'm pleased to introduce the Commanding General of First Corps, Lieutenant General Xavier T. Brunson. Hey, um, because this is a technology-focused conference, I'm going to throw my glasses on before I get started so that I can at least appear to be smart. Uh, good afternoon to you all from Joint Base Lewis Accord. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. I, I'm extremely appreciative of that. I'm honored and grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today to this group of trained professionals. And uh, I want to extend a special thank you to FCF for sponsoring this tremendous event. Uh, the discussions, collaboration, and learning that's going to occur this week amongst academia, industry, government, and the military will undoubtedly lead to future work that is incredibly as a warfighter, I'm also a consumer of the capabilities and technology that you all will discuss. And after this conference, will lead to development, I'm sure. But over the course of this conference, have the conversations that we ought to have uh, that we might continue to prepare for a few. Excuse me for often dipping into the language of warfighting because I'm a warfighter. But I think in industry parlance, you think of me as a simple consumer. And we, the consumer, need a robust, reliable, and resilient network. Over the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'll share with you how First Corps operates in the Indo-Pacific region. One of my bosses, the U.S. Army Pacific Commander, General Charles Flynn, refers to the region as the most consequential theater for our nation, most consequential. To the war, the Indo-Pacific region spans from the west coast of the United States all the way to Pakistan. And while many think of the Indo-Pacific region as vastly dominated by water, it's important to recognize that the region consists of 36 nations, and of these four are the world's most populated. Four of the largest economies in the world are there. Nine of the world's megacities are there. And even the world's largest army, seven of which exist in the region. This region contains the densest jungles on the earth, the highest mountain range, the coldest national capital on earth. That's in Mongolia, if you were curious. My intent is to convey war context in the Indo-Pacific region, discuss the required capabilities of the network as a consumer, close with answering any questions you have of me. And before I begin, fully, on a panel later, I hear from my deputy operations, your general Cale, members of my staff, along with our teammates, 
General Kurtzuki.com. General Dilray, the Director of the Network Cross Insurance Team. This, this panel will cover more in depth discussion on what SCORE is doing as it relates to distributed operations. And it'll also talk a little bit about the fact that it is all enabled by Unified Network. As a commander of America's First Corps, uh, much of the strategy and operational approach is focused on being ready operating in active competition with our nation's basic challenge while remaining in crisis in our economies, wherever that may be. As a leader component, achieve this building joint readiness, the time denying terrain presence, both human and geographic, and building increased confidence and interoperability with the allies and regions. In the Indo synchronizing becomes more, more complex as we operate in a maritime environment across multiple contested domains to include cyber, EW, specs. Dominance and security is no longer on conclusion because in the end, we're dealing with Every domain environment or battle space will be contested. Even the sanctuary of the homeland is not a given. I believe First Corps could be in contact with would ever even think of the As a commander in operation in the Indo-Pacific, I ask myself often, how do we contribute to the world? Now more than anything, it's important to know that First Corps, in order to provide these options to user pack and U.S. we have to be the international team. Increasingly, operating inside the First Corps, Stretching from Japan all the way south to the west edge of the Philippines and down into Indonesia. As a consumer in this environment, we need new and new solutions to match the reality of the environment. The organization I command is the highest echelon tactical headquarters in our arm. But also, the operational strategic implications. <laughs> to again quote General Flynn, I would tell you that. He says nothing is more scalable than it. We can purpose build command and control code based on required capabilities, allowing us to operate small as a self unified people, build into a multinational joint force headquarters well over six. Given this, we can operate as the tactical land component of a joint force or as a joint task force. We can also integrate with partner nations to form a combined task force all in a host of missions. As we analyze and reason about how we might keep this in a continuum of competition with the ability to support crisis and conflict, we developed the concept of distributed missions. The distributed, survival, agile, resilient application of war fighting and control capabilities for the first core in the end Pacific is a requirement as a consumer leader. First Corps needs to be able to fight free, if you will, where nodes are in shared understanding of the operational and informational environment. And nodes are empowered to make decisions to compete against our basic challenge. Now, a bit further on distributed mission command, the Corps operates in the Indo-Pacific eight to ten months out of every year in support of multiple bilateral and multilateral lectures. In the course of steady state operations, this places us in a posture in the land domain to respond to any natural or man contingency or crisis. First, we must be present with available command and control nodes for the United States Army and for the We analyze the multi technical environment capabilities that exist today. And distribution at the core level is necessary. The necessary condition for distributed operations to be successful. And for them to be successful, the team needs to know the plane. They need to understand intent. They must absolutely comprehend the decisions required in line with the thing of actions. They must have absolutely bias for action. All in it by that. Distributing our headquarters into notes requires thinking very differently than the existing doctrine would have us act. Distributed mission command is a construct in which we are not dispersed, deliberately placed in space and to achieve effect. 
Within this framework, multiple C2 nodes is the operational model. First quarterly used to provide survivable, resilient, agile mission command structure. As a consumer, these distributed nodes must be survivable, resilient, and agile. Survival because the loss of a single node should not render the entirety of our command structure non-capable. Resilient because in test environments, the forward nodes must have the necessary capabilities to carry out the fight. And agile because we need to adapt and scale to support whatever mission we're given. These forward nodes are capable of receiving and integrating joint capabilities at the point of need and redeploy throughout the facility. With this approach, we could have multiple command nodes stretching from CONUS, the continent of the United States, all the way to the first island chain. And there are five key takeaways that I want to share. First, according to Doc, core level command nodes is not optimized for the Indo-Pacific. Just to emphasize the scale of the distributed operations in this region, the nation of Indonesia is equal to the distance Portland on the West Coast to several hundred miles east of Washington, D.C. and the Atlantic Ocean. This means that the fixed command force we spent 20 years fighting with the Middle East is no longer feasible due to a variety of factors. And those range from varying physical infrastructure, host station capabilities, predict unpredictable weather patterns, the potential constant surveillance across all the way. Our doctrinal concept of a main and a subordinate or smaller type of command no longer makes sense tactically or technically in this region. Additionally, since these command must operate under constant surveillance, the signature we emit must be continuously monitored and modified to remain below the threshold of detection, perception of either actions or even our inaction. Second, these command posts will be required to be smaller and more to there are limitations in our methodology that our military uses to deploy force. Conceptually, the doctrine of war main tactical command will require large amounts of strategic In conflict or crisis, so that we're not late to need, it is absolutely important that we don't place this great challenge in the joint force, but we simply look to get smaller, more, de more deployable, and less reliant on deployment risks. Third, each node must be purpose-built or task organized for the mission, representing all the warfighting functions that are necessary capabilities, but scale and duration being our limited principle for node composition. And as I said before, it could be as small as three to five, as large as six, whatever the mission is. Fourth, all nodes must be connected by a theater network architecture that can support any force army and it'll allow them to enable shared understanding of operational and informational environment. And lastly, node capabilities, especially the must be inherently interoperable with our joint partners, including the following functions. You've got to be able to create joint fires and include intelligence and reconnaissance. Integration of command and control with battle management systems, a secure human operating operationalization of data. To support decision must be intuitive enough. Mitigate commanders being out of position or unable to communicate while enabling our nodes to fight free of will. And that will allow us to all have bias for action as it relates to real time safety. Distribution requires us to deploy our headquarters into nodes where each node is cross functional, it's connected to the other nodes through resilient communications infrastructure and staff processes that are formulated to support the commander to make decisions across vast space, multiple teams. I'm certain our distributed operational approach will improve speed of decision-making and execution. Essentially, we want to keep the nodes smaller and distributed to improve our access to data. So commanders see first, understand first, are able to decide first, and then act decisively. However, for this to work, we need a net, not just a tactical network of radios, but a holistic network architecture that enables the flow of data edge to the enterprise and from the enterprise out to the edge. 
As I mentioned, this organization's requirements spanning the needing to communicate safe with an armored vehicle unit in Thailand to the strategic level, informing decision makers to help them decide to scale actions up or down or maintain in mass or presence. More distribution requires more virtual connectedness between nodes on the land, sea, or even in the air. Across all, a joint fires observer on a hill must be able to connect with a combined task force headquarters. Maybe they're afloat on a Navy ship in the middle of the ocean, and ultimately with the Joint Command and Control Center that provides situational awareness to decision makers. As a warfighter and as a consumer, I'm hoping you can help not only America's first corps, but our military writ large compete with our facing challenge in the most consequential operating environment the nation's military must continue and compete. We need a network that enables distributed survival, resilient, agile networks, and enables them to have that sense of action. A final data, whether that be intelligence, targeting, logistics, access to data drives integrated form decision making. Making core data centric organization believe that's organizing that in the future will be based on a deep look into the capabilities, capacity necessary to fight, all tasks organized by the availability of the net. I don't presume to know or understand all that will be required to do this, but I do know intelligence, bribe, and the innovation that we need to empower this effort exists right there in that a network that is transport agnostic, inherent joint plug and play to enable rapid, scalable employment of forces, a persistent information environment that stores, shares, computes data across joint multinational partners to enable shared understanding of the operational and information environment, a data network that allows the movement of data from the edge of the enterprise, from the enterprise back to the edge, all in order to commander's decision to process and empower bias for This capability must be operable across the Army and even our multiple forces. This week, the technological collaboration, learning, and sharing of ideas is incredibly My comments today are intended not as an indictment, but to provide a foundational context for this effective work that's Additionally, it's got to continue this conference. In fact, in early October, at SEA Pacific Northwest chapter will host a conference where I'll be able to share some of our great lessons learned over the next months as we input distributed mission command operation through notes during our four war fighter exercise. I really hope to see you all there so we can continue these important conversations. I appreciate the invitation by Stephanie and Augusta to participate in the distance and I was unable to be with you all today. Uh, I also thank you for your time. I don't know what the time allows for questions, but I eagerly await any that come. And then, behold, I got a question from one of my speakers today that I would share with you I answer. Thank you again for your time. And it's very, very good. Thank you.
sir, we do have a question from the audience. You spoke about to information environment today. In the vast information environment we live in, how does the I-Corps protect the movement of soldiers, equipment, and critical assets before reaching conflict? So the, the first thing is we, we treat a lot of that information like Fight Club, right? Nobody talks about Fight Club. And uh, one of the ways that we do it is by trying to ensure that the things that we do, every place, if you will, has a certain amount of noise about it. Um, so, for example, if we're in Guam, there's a certain amount of noise across the spectrum, whether that be EW or just regular signals that exist. If we can manage to go to the places where we need, again, smaller nodes allow us to do this, we don't present a target to ourselves. Uh, force protection is something that this region, based on the way we have to move around, it, is absolutely inherent in everything that we do. So there are things that we do routinely here uh, in terms of exercises and training that we always attempt to mask by other things. So um, I think most times it's called cover for action. So we're doing things, but we don't necessarily want our pacing challenge to understand those things that we're doing. We'd like to just appear there. I also mentioned that we're in the region for eight to 10 months out of a year. Uh, and by having smaller nodes, we're able to keep people present and keep them set in theater so there is less movement. I believe that the power in the future is going to come from intra theater, by inter theater movements. And some of that has to do with our ability to be present geographically uh, at the places where we already are and then put our footprint there. There's only so much that markets, if you will, can bear in terms of size. The Army has a quality that is, exists only in our mass. So if we can make that smaller, then we're able to protect ourselves as we move and pull other elements and capabilities that we need for. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, so we have another question from the audience. How does First Corps plan to fight in a contested EMS? Well, again, uh, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, but, but one of the things that, that we have to get familiar with, again, is deception. And the things that units have to do as it relates to deception and masking of signals. And in that environment, another key thing is, as I mentioned earlier, is if I can get, if we can get, if our Army can get people to understand the mission when things need to be achieved in time, everyone understands the decisions that have to be made. And we have to communicate a little bit less. And we can't confuse our proximity to a location where decisions have to be made with a need to always communicate with that, with that node, if you will, or that element that's in contact. I think also we have to do things that we knew about when we had uh, PRC 77s, and I'm sure there are some veterans there in that audience that remember when we had the PRC 77 and how you could almost set frequencies in the dark by just hearing the clicks and moving to a stop. We've got to get those skills back into our force. I think for so long we worried about losing our abilities as it related to field craft. The future will call for us to be uh, or to raise our technical acumen so that we can get beyond a lot of these things that we place up as impediments right now. And allow, that will allow us to see these as potential opportunities to see an enemy's vulnerabilities and take advantage of that. We know that they're going to be monitoring us. We know that we're going to be in contact from the minute we, uh, we leave our shores. We have to expect that. And then by building this force that is more acute to things tactical, uh, technical advice, things tactical, we'll always be able to do in our army. We will always do great in terms of training and, and our tactical abilities. But that technical acumen is going to be required on the next battlefields so that we can do everything that your question suggests, so that we can operate in that limited environment. Because that's what it really is. It's a new condition. We have to accept that condition, and then we plan around it. We've all grown up in the military our entire life dealing with tasks, conditions and standard 
the expectation, as our chief always says, is the Army shows up on the field to win. And in order to win, that means that we have to ameliorate, however we do that, those conditions that exist in the place where we're going to do, as the chief says, to win. Because winning matters. So that would be my answer to that question. All right, sir, we have one more question. Across the Army, we are short on talent for people with IT skills. How has signal manning affected your team's ability to support multiple command posts across a distributed environment? Okay. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use, uh, some might consider this a sight gag, but I'm going to use somebody who is doing my tech for me right now. Come here, Sergeant Johnson. This is Sergeant First Class Kenny Johnson. He's my communicator here within my core headquarters. Uh, he is skilled at all things communication. He's the reason why I'm able to see you and talk to you today. Uh, what we have is a very, very skilled uh, signal workforce across our army. But there are requirements. Um, when I'm at my house, uh, he has taught me things to do so that I can communicate. So what we're able to do is we're able to use what I'll just call signal multiplication. And if we can teach our soldiers to do things that we expect the experts to do, we place them in a position where they are now over. I introduced you. <laughs> where they're able to teach us all how to operate our system. If we were to sit around and. I guess, look at the fact that we don't have all that we would like to have, as opposed to thinking about the capabilities necessary in the force. I choose to think about the capabilities we need by the capacity. Now, would it be great to have 100% in every signal unit that we have? Oh, gosh, that would be amazing. But I think we need to focus more on the capabilities that ought to be resident in our force in the future and how we train that across the force. There's a reticence sometimes to say, well, we can't do cyber defense because we don't have the necessary cyber defense warrant that we need. Well, go train somebody. We can train somebody to do that because there's standards that exist there. So why would we not say, I don't have, but I'll train. If anybody's an officer here and you've been a BMO, a, a, a battalion or a brigade maintenance officer, you were not trained to do that in IOBC, but, but you were given the job. You were trained by a senior warrant who told you what your job was, what the expectations were. I think if we raise our expectations for our force, we'll spend more time focusing on the capabilities that are resident in the force and less time working about the capacity. There's a certain reality to the capacity, which is why our chief has got us all focusing right now on recruiting and retention. Because those things are absolutely important to this all-volunteer force that's done so tremendously over time. Uh, ever since the Big Five came aboard, this all-volunteer force has been magnificent, and it remains so. Are there shortages? Or are there problems with the capacities we have? I think the onus is on us to all work as recruiters for the next force so that we don't have these shortages. But to retain the talent that we have because they're absolutely necessary. And to then recast that talent, that they might be involved in the training of the force so that we can do the things that we need to do. Thanks for that question. That was our final question for General Brunson. Please welcome General Paul Stanton to the stage. Hey, sir, uh, on behalf of uh, AFSIA and all of us here at TechNet Augusta, I'd just like to say a resounding thank you. Uh, I, I got the, the nerd chills listening to you get all fired up about training. I uh, uh, applaud the fact that your SIGO is in the room with you. Um, your glasses do, in fact, make you look studious and erudite. Um, however, those of us that know you uh, know that they're not necessary to capture your intellect. And it's inspiring to listen to a warfighter uh, talk about data 
and the requirements for a, uh, a unified network. Um, your, your, your message is resonating like a clarion call. Um, you have a unique multi-domain fight in an international uh, multi-partner environment where the weather and constant surveillance are going to cause you challenges against our pacing threat. We now take your challenges as our technical pacing threat. Uh, we all recognize where our priorities lie in the Indo-PACOM theater, um, and we need to help you uh, resolve those challenges. I appreciate your insights, your perspective as a, a warfighter, and of course, your valuable time recognizing that as a core commander, uh, your willingness to dedicate the time and preparation and the time to deliver your remarks um, it certainly does not go unnoticed. Uh, thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. Hey, Paul, thank you to you and the team, and congratulations on your promotion. That looks good on you. Proud of you, Paul. Strike, sir. Strike. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending the U.S. Army Partnership for your success pays ceremony. The United States Army Pays Program is a strategic partnership between the U.S. Army and a cross-section of private industry, academia, and businesses to include federal, state, and local agencies. The United States Army's Pays Program guarantees soldiers and ROTC cadets five job interviews and possible employment after the Army. Today's partnership memorandum of agreement between the United States Army and Janus Research Group, LLC, will be signed by Major General Paul Stanton, Commanding General of the U.S. Army Cyber Center of Excellence, Fort Gordon, and Mr. John Dewey, President and CEO of Janus Research Group, LLC. <clears throat> Any guest? Okay. During the last few weeks, we have visited with multiple mayors, boards of education members, school officials, and academic outreach teams. At this time, we would like to recognize Mr. Williams and Mr. Clifford from the North Augusta Mayor's Office, Ms. Gibbons, and from the Augusta Mayor's Office. I would like to introduce you to Mr. John Dewey. Uh, Mr. Dewey currently serves as the President and Chief Executive Officer for Janus Research Group, LLC. As CEO, Mr. Dewey leads Janus in striving to increase their DOD and commercial mission partners' organizational performance through industry-leading solutions and innovation developing tomorrow's answers today. Mr. Dewey joined the Janus industry after completing more than 24 years of distinguished service in the United States Army. Mr. Durley, Dewey currently holds a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, and a Master of Strategic Studies from the Air War College, Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. John Dewey. Well, General Stanton, thanks for participating in this ceremony. And Janice is very proud to be a strategic partner with the Army and part of the PACE program. We have about 450 employees and over half are veterans. So we're doing our best to keep that military experience on the mission, and we'll continue to do so. And I would say to my industry brethren that this program is a great program. It's a simple process. It takes just a few minutes to sign up. There's no financial investment, and you get the benefit of military experience, staying within the, our missions, and the character, you know, this tested character of our vets. So go sign up today. Ladies and gentlemen, Major General Stanton and Mr. Dewey will now sign the memorandum of agreement that solidifies our partnership with Janus Research Group, LLC. Major General Stanton will also present a certificate of participation and a plaque to Janus Research Group, LLC, on behalf of the Army, the U.S. Army Pays Program.
General Stanton, do you have any closing remarks? Hey, I, so, it, really just impromptu here, um, I, I, I want to extend a, a heartfelt thank you uh, to, to Mr. John Dewey and to, the, to uh, Janice. Uh, this is a fantastic program. It's a fantastic opportunity. Um, it is in line with our transition assistance. It's in line with our concept of being a soldier for life. Um, it is a mutually beneficial opportunity uh, where great companies like Janus that are known for hiring um, our military service members um, keep the technology and the, the insights from our team uh, right in-house with companies that come back and, and help us solve our problems. Thank you, sir. This concludes today's session. Please join us back here at 4 p.m.